nice picture of Al Raby working on his new critical mass. Looks like he's got a spare Sato 28 cylinder there. Check that out, critical mass. I'm sure Al is well along on building it. We've enjoyed sharing the videos with him. And we look forward to some pictures of it flying. Now we're expecting a little break in the weather. And we got some some parts, we got some welding some welded exhaust from Scott Dinger that we're going to try to retrofit and get outside and while, while the weather's holding and boy it's, it's sure been hit or miss lately but we want to get the, the lightweight exhaust on this and hopefully get a couple of flights if the weather breaks if it doesn't we're just going to run it in the backyard but today's job I want to try to get the exhaust fit on here as the first thing but let me look in the mail as some cool stuff came in the mail today first picture we have here and this is from Scott Dinger. Scott did the welding on our B25 exhaust. I want to thank him. Now this is a Derringer and it's got a carbon fiber cowl so yes nice to see that more and more people are adapting this technology. This is Scott's business. Now I wanted to put this card we don't want to cover his face up but this for anybody that wants some high-tech welding done and he really has the ability to do some really high-tech stuff he's been real good I got the parts back very quickly and it's it's just been a good I guess a good interaction working with Scott now let me show these exhausts in their rough state I have to do a little work on them I need to grind out here port and polish them but these have the exhaust instead of having that rubber piece and they're significantly lighter than the, the ones that are machined out of a block but you can see he did all this welding on these. And there it is some that's some nice work. I'm gonna polish them up a little, just clean them up, pour them in here, make up a gasket and get this hopefully tonight get this fit on the B25. But I was just thinking this may be a neat little there's other things I can be thinking you can use this kind of an exhaust for. Set in the terms of semi-scale outer radial cowling. So many neat new things in the world of stunt. But anyway, from Scott. And that's just in case you missed his phone number. He's in California in Simi Valley. Number is 805-526-9074. And we really do appreciate the help with the B-25 project. Nice, real nice photo set here from Jim Morway. And I want to read his captions because, again, I'll be passing most of these on to Stunt News. Uh, this is the District 6 logos. And he's named the plane the uh, Eolus. Pronounced silent A, Eolus. Inboard side of the nose, the logos. We can get this back a little. There's some pretty neat stuff on here. I'll read his caption. You gotta look at this real close, the artwork. I read the caption, looked for a year to find the right God of the Wind picture. Found it in the Michigan win Michigan winter by a car dealer's advertisement for tune-ups. Found these two logos, the Ace and the Dice, in a women's beauty shop. Photo 6. Outboard, good shot of the pilot, rivets on the fillets, decals made by me, like the logos and fillets on the wing, or paint. This is a nice one. I like this little guy here. Different view of the God of the Wind. Outboard side of the district little insignias, kind of unique.
Yeah, these are the bottom decals blown up big time. He says here, my tune, my tune pipe. That's some nice tune pipe. <laughs> Number 11, all paint, either touch-up spray gun or airbrush letters and rivets. And we'll be passing some of these on to Stunt News. Nice lettering. Wow. It's really a nice lettering job here. I'm glad he wrote a caption on this because it, if you don't look at this real close, you don't... It, what happens is, the first time I read through the pictures, I looked and I didn't really understand what that was. God of the Winds. It's kind of cool. Nice colors, too. If you look at the colors real close, it's like a deep purple. Nice picture here, number Jim Morway, Jet 60, I'm reading this caption, 12 4 carbon fiber prop, windy tune pipe, John Paris's son Mike at John's Field, New Pampa member. I see there's some spares here. It's quite a nice looking plane, in fact, I have to admit. Anyway, Jim, we will be, here's another shot at the bottom. We'll be passing some of these on to see what Tom Morris would like to print. There's enough for him to pick from here. And uh, we'll look for these in stunt news. In the meantime, let's get over and start working on that B-25. I just took this on a flat surface. After porting it, what I tried to do is just do a very gentle with the Dremel tool. A gentle, I want to get a, I don't know if you can see it, just get any of the welder dripped in there off. I need to get the gasket and the other piece off, then I'll match this to the gasket surface. But that is really going to be a nice little exhaust, and boy, super, super light. Many thanks to Scott Dinger. Got some 4 0 steel wheel, which usually works pretty good to clean up aluminum. Yeah, it's going to clean up real nice. Just going to take a little time. I want to clean it up. Now I got to make up the little gaskets. some idea of how that's polishing up, that's really going to look nice. Really going to be some slick custom exhaust there. He's really polished up nice. Well, now we need to get the B25 already has the cowls off, get it up here and fit up the gaskets. Get this area trued up so it bolts perfectly flat up against the motor and seals up at that point. The, the original machine parts. Now, the next thing is to make up the gasket, get an accurate gasket for this. It looks like it's going to work out just fine. And we'll be ready to, if we get some weather, give this a little test run. Oh, I really like the way these look. Really add a nice dimension to the way this works. I 
and it should be. See, one of the things when you go to get this battery off at this side, and this is blowing straight out, it's really a problem. This should clear. Well, every time I say should, would, could, maybe, baby. Shush, chicky. Anyway, we're ready to test. As soon as the rain stops, we'll try to get out there with less one of these days and sync everything back up. Every time you change a part of the engine, of course, it's a good idea to resync everything. Now you can see what's happened here, and I guess this is a decent, something that happens to almost everybody time to time. We put a ding in this. And what I wanted to do is I want to get a 1200 sanding on this. Once I clean this area up, I want to, in essence, the 1200 is almost like polishing it. And then make a decision if I want to put one more light coat of primer. So we've got plenty of primer on here now. And we could really work the Brodac primer. The Brodac primer is just such a good material. And you can see the little spot as we get rid of the, the 3M filler. It looks like it's going to need one more coated a little filling material. But we might be one coat away from having this guy ready to go. Let me show that up close here. This is what happens. You put your fingernail or a ding or something in it. So I try not to fill it all in one coat. Try to put one thin coat, let it dry. In a matter of five minutes, it'll be dry again. Second coat. Now while that's drying, I can pretty much work on the rest of the ring. Hang on how fussy you are. Well, we're trying to be real fussy on this part. We can just roughen that area up just a little bit. But there's always, the trick with all this stuff is to get it in on in a lot of thin coats. It dries out, it shrinks better, everything is better when you get a lot of thin coats. That's ready for another coat now. This is the part number, it's a 3M part number, 05960. It's made just for doing what I'm doing right here. Or even in a final finish, built up wing, it wouldn't matter. But the trick, again, is not to glob it on and don't even think about trying to use it to make fillets or anything. Now that really will only take about five minutes to, to dry out. But this is a small spot like that. You can use a razor blade or a rubber trowel. Good to have some of this in the shop, but it's not good to anything structural. You don't want to make any fillets or you don't want to hold the canopy on with it or anything. It's just for filling in little, little dents like that. What that I've tried to do is almost everything with a block if possible. And I've tried to not, I don't want to go in one direction, I want to constantly change the direction so I can pick up any other imperfections in here. They can sand one wing while that other one is kind of drying out. I want to get a nice radius on the trailing edge if possible. Because we'll have the material here this week to build a mold. Again, I've said this a million times, but it's so true. The reason I'm more than fussy here is, in essence, I'm sanding out every wing that'll ever come out of this mold. And because we already have two functional molds, we've added a third one. We have three different size ships we can build, and we can replicate those uh, relatively easily. But we're trying to make each one, of course, just a little bit better, each mold a little bit nicer. Trying to go the extra mile on this. A Brodac primer really sands out beautifully. Boy, is that ever the material of choice. And this is just elbow grease, and I won't belabor this, but we're looking at a couple of hours here of sanding, so we'll just try to get this done. And if we go through in a whole lot of spots, it's real easy. We'll just put another coat right on. Uh, 
and it looks like it's really coming nice. The 1200 really leaves a nice, like a gloss. Next step is to get some good old Gorms polish, and Gorms, of course, works so well with any lacquer dope finish. Want to polish right down to the base of the mold here, just as if I were buffing, no different than if I were buffing out a plane. A lot of people don't think you can really buff Brodak primer. Well, you can. It's not going to come up like like white paint would, but it's certainly going to have some shine when you're done. You get some idea here, the buff part and how much time it should take to buff. Now we'll move the next section. I'll do a section about the size of my hand each time. Let's just see if you can see. I'm not sure you can see the amount of shine that's on there. Ball, shiny, and that's exactly how Brodak Dope would come up too. Well, you can just see the shine and where we've stopped. And of course the next step, I'll do it off camera, just get a couple of cups of coffee out and buff out the whole mold. Now, even after polishing this whole thing out with Gorham's, I was just really unhappy. I had a couple little spots along the tip here. I wanted to fill in that spot in the leading edge. And a lot of times, and the point of this is that you don't, you don't really see these little errors and flaws. While a surface is dull, it's when it's shiny, all of a sudden you see these flaws and errors come jumping out at you. And Basically, I'm going to spend the rest of the day raking leaves. You can see we're burying leaves here, so I thought, well, why not? We're not in a rush to do this project, and when we get this wing mold done, I really want it to be as good as I can possibly make it, so... Looks like a good day to rake leaves. Now, starting with this tape, I wanted to I wanted to add a segment to each tape or many of the tapes. We get questions I get questions pretty much on email or by mail or in person. And a lot of them have the exactly the same answer to the same question. And and what happens on my website is I type the same thing over and over again. Well what I want to try to do is get some commonly asked questions and put what I think is a good answer on video. And this way, when the same question comes up, I can supply the video. I believe it or not, I think the most commonly asked question, we have people in our club that build a plane, doesn't matter what plane it is, and in the course of flying it, they're not sure if it's tail heavy, nose heavy, or what to do about it, or how to know if it's right. So let's... This is probably the most basic question. I have answered this a thousand times on email or at our club. So let's see if we can make a little list up that can that can be of some useful information when people are building a new plane. The step one would always be to find the CG on the plans for the ship that you're building. But let me explain how this can work. It can either work in your favor or against you from from a lot of different, in a lot of different ways, but so that you have a good starting point, a good baseline of knowledge. The first thing to understand is there's a lot less of a plane in front of the center of gravity than there is behind it. In a lot of cases, you can have as much as 80% of the plane, and that meaning the wood, the paint, the filler, Picture in your mind what this is like. It's like a seesaw. It wants to balance on that CG. Now usually the person that designed the plane sets the CG for himself. And as an example, if you look at Paul Walker's impact, where Paul is world champion flyer, 
his CG is further back. An entry level person or a person that wants to start trimming with a nose heavy condition, and that would always be my suggestion, you want to start a little bit forward of the CG for the first couple of flights. But you need to, at some point in time, find the CG that's comfortable for you. And a good place to start is where it's shown on the plans, interpolating that if you're an expert level flyer, you might want to go back an eighth of an inch. If you're a rank beginner, advanced flyer, you might want to be an eighth of an inch in front of it. But without knowing where the CG is, you really do have a problem. Now. We had a plane, I don't remember which plane this was, I think Stevie McBride built the plane. And when I said, give me the plans, let me see the CG, there was no CG on the plans. Well, that's something you really should have. So, when a person designs a plane, and in the case of the Cardinal, you know, we try to put a mean average because a lot of the people are not experts, but we'd like to get a good basic place to start the plane in balance. Some basic symptoms of when you have a plane that's nose heavy, that's balanced forward of the CG that's called for on the plans. The first symptom is the plane usually will turn very soft. A nose heavy plane will almost always glide beautifully. Level flight, inverted flight, and to a certain degree round maneuvers will be really nice. Well, if you have any or all of these things, you, you kind of can figure out and you might be a little more nose heavy than the optimum. And what I'm trying to do here is, is give symptoms so that you can fine tune that last little bit to suit your needs, of course. Another thing, if a plane is meant to be built that, well, let's just make a pretend thing up, a nobler that's made to be about 48 ounces, 45 ounces, and you build it, at 35 ounces, it's almost always going to be nose heavy because you don't have the, the weight of the wood and of the overall model, again, behind the CG. There's an optimum weight, but as you build a plane lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter, it becomes more and more and more nose heavy. And if you know ahead of time you're going to build an ultra, ultra light plane, you might want to even consider shortening the nose a half an inch. And just as an example, what would be some of the typical things that would happen if a plane is tail heavy? Well, it might, ha it might tend to have a violent, hard to control, I call it an uncontrollable turn where it just darts off in some direction that's hard to control. Just every time, and I remember Ted Fancher wrote about this, one of the, one of the keynotes he looked at when he was trimming a plane was when it was gliding, if you couldn't hold it level, if it would porpoise, tend not to hold a nice level flight, then you can see what's happening. Almost everything that's on one side of this equation, the opposite thing is on the other side of the equation. Okay? The same thing would hold true. Nice level flight, it's going to be very unstable, or we call that ferreting. Ferreting being that the plane never really want, just, I mean, you come out of a corner, it'll just, it just never locks in. No lock. Usually a symptom of a tail heavy plane. And this was the original question when we were trimming out the plane in question, was the plane turned out to be extremely tail heavy. And no matter what we did, we couldn't get it to fly the way it was until we got the CG where it should be. Now, another thing too, a tail heavy plane is almost always a symptom of the overall weight being heavy. What's the reason for that? The reason is we have so much of the plane behind the CG that the heavier the plane becomes, picture that this, this is like a seesaw. And the heavier the, the heavier the model becomes, the more and more weight is on this side of the seesaw because the pivot is not in the middle. If we were building a plane and 50% was in front and 50% was in back, it'd be equal. It wouldn't matter how heavy or light you made it. But, but that's not the case. And the case might be 70, 30 or something for different models. But always keep in mind, light models, models that are usually too, too light for that design, will tend to be nose heavy. Heavy planes will tend to be tail heavy. So this is good 
good basic information you probably can use if you're just building your first plane or coming back to the hobby after many years. So let's pretend we have, we know we have a nose heavy ship. We've measured the CG and we've taken into account all the things that, that tend to be the symptoms of a nose heavy plane. We don't have much of a corner, but the plane glides real nice. And we built the plane a little bit lighter than we originally intended. Flies great in level of flight. What can we do about this to make it better? Well, the first thing we could do is take a roll of solder, ordinary plumber's solder, down to the field. Start with maybe a half ounce. Put a little bit of solder where the tail wheel is. Wrap an ounce of solder. See if it got better or worse. Oh, it got better. Wrap another half ounce or an ounce. At some point, it's going to get worse, and it'll show the symptoms of being tail heavy. We'll then take a half ounce off, get back to where that, just use it as a balance. I'm going to put too much on. Oh, it's too tail heavy now. So you, you'll figure out what this amount, the amount that it's out, and then one of the choices you can have, if you, you have a machinist friend, or you can leave the solder on, of course, or you can make a brass tail wheel. This is a big one. If you have a nose heavy ship, you're probably going to want the line spacing bigger than a tail heavy plane. A tail heavy plane is going to need shorter line spacing. Nose heavy plane, you can open it up. Sometimes you can open it up to the maximum. You also can do another thing. If you have a bar handle, of course, if you have a handle that has a bar, you can keep pulling the bar in until it hits your knuckles. Or if you have a, a typical windy handle, you can cut some of this off. Just Take the cable out and saw it right off. You can shorten the arms up. Shorter arms will always work good on a nose heavy plane. Longer arms on a smaller plane or on a tail heavy plane. The things that are not so obvious, but, but they're definitely usable. If you have a nose heavy ship, you can go to a tongue muffler. Almost every motor ever made, they have tongue mufflers for now. A lighter spinner, a lot of times just having a lighter spinner is the answer. And in the worst of all worlds, you can really hit pay dirt, carbon fiber fuel tank. All these things are going to get weight out of the front and at the same time reduce the overall weight. So it's a win-win situation. When the readouts forward, a lot of times it'll help a, a really nose-heavy ship perform, even if you don't have some of the other things that would be a help to make the plane lighter and get the CG in a more realistic position. The tests I always do, if, I, if I'm flying somebody else's plane, I'm trying to help them trim it out, and it really feels nose heavy, and I'm not sure how much nose weight we have to get out, fly the plane with the cowling off one flight. A lot of times you can find out just how much. Now, if the cowling were to weigh an ounce, you know typically you can put half of that amount on the tail wheel. That's just a good starting point. It gets you into the ballpark. And if the plane flies better with the cowl off, it turns nicer, or it seems to fit your needs better, well, you know you either have to take care of it by putting some tail weight on, or do something that will lighten up the nose of the plane. In some cases, even using a lighter motor can help. A couple of the things you can do to deal with a plane that's on the tail heavy side. Again, most of the things are the opposite. Nose heavy things, you reverse them for tail heavy things. Obvious thing is, it's a tail heavy plane. The, the problem that you almost always run into is a tail heavy plane tends to already be too heavy. So you wind up adding weight, and that always becomes, well, the lesser of two choices. But there are good choices. Good choices would be, I'm not sure everybody wants to do this, that's why I'm leaving a question mark on it, is buff off the paint behind the CG, especially on the bottom of the stab. That's many planes I've had. I've taken them right down to where there was no clear on the bottom of the tail. There was tail wheel, of course. A lot of people I've seen that have a tail every plane have a one-inch a one tail wheel. Get the little tiny guy going on. For the handle, try to get the cable as close to your hand as possible. 
and let the arms be as long as possible. If you have one of those bar handles, let the bar be way out here. That'll, that'll help to a certain degree. It's not the cure. The cure is to get the CG right, but these things will just help you live with conditions. Once you do everything you can, then you really sometimes you just have to bite the bullet. But you've built a couple of planes, and you know you tend to build heavy, add a half inch to the nose moment arm, because it'll let the weight that's already on the plane do the balancing instead of having to add more and more weight to it. Adding a half inch to the nose of almost any design isn't going to be a killer in terms of performance, but it'll help the CG, and the overall thing will be you probably, if the plane is heavy, it'll allow you to balance it with a lot less total weight. If you're stuck in limbo land, and you don't really know where the CG should be on a given design, you can always just, this is a rough estimate way of doing it. We're going to always reference and assume that the trailing edge is straight. On a plane like the B-25 where the trailing edge sweeps forward, these numbers don't really work out exactly the way they should. What you want to do is take the two dimensions of the wing at the root, and let's just make easy numbers up. Let's say that's 10 inches, and let's say at the tip the dimension is 8 inches. Most planes, most modern stunt ships have about two inches of rake, somewhere in that area. So you know you've got the, the root dimension, the tip dimension. What you do is you add them together, and then you divide by two. And that gives you the mean average chord. In this case, that's nine inches. Our mean average chord because we know it's nine inches, now we can do a percentage. And we'd like to be at 15%. So that means we want to be, just to start numbers off, a good place to start would be we want to be 15%, and this part of it should be 85%. Now, some people prefer to measure from the leading edge back. That's not as accurate, I don't think as measuring from the trailing edge forward. So if you set this, that would also give you the, the choice of, and I'm, I'm suggesting everybody, except absolute top experts, start trimming a plane at about 15%. Somewhere in the, in the dimension, at about 20%, that's where I like to fly my planes. That's where, by the way, the B-25 was trimmed, bench trimmed, and we've been trying to get nose weight out at about 20% of that dimension. And I've seen, I'm going to use Paul Walker's impact as an example, he flies at about 25%. So, but keep in mind, he's, he's a world-class flyer. So you can kind of pick your own poison as to how you want to figure that out, where you want that percentage to be. But it's a percentage of the mean average chord, and that's always just, just a good place to start if they don't have a starting point on the plans. Now the other situation you can keep in mind is once you've established that CG, and let's say you're going to figure it out for your, that you decide your, your dimension is going to be 20%. Let's just figure this out. So you can calculate that up, balance the plane right in by the root. Now what you can do to start a plane that has never been flown yet, if you interpolate that line out to the wingtip, measuring from here forward, you can kind of give yourself one inch of line rake to start with. So that would be, if this dimension is eight inches, this dimension should be seven inches. In other words, the lines have a rake of one inch to start with. That's just the starting point. That's why we always build planes, or most of the time, with adjustable leadouts. I would start at one inch of line rake. One inch of rake measured from, if the CG is a dimension from the flap line forward, just deduct an inch and put the mean average. Now, it's not one lead out or the other. You measure the front lead out, you measure the back lead out. And the point that we're looking for is the mean average of the two. So if a lot of that makes sense, I think a lot of that answers the question. And I'll give, give Stevie a copy of this video instead of typing out a 20-page email to him of what he can and cannot do. 
the next time we're at the field, we're going to fly his plane again and, and hopefully decide then, well, if I get him to bring it to the, the house here, where he is and what we can do to make it a little bit better. If you've got a question you'd like me to answer or try to answer or some information that uh, I might be able to pass along, we're going to try to do one of these on, if not every video, every other video in the future as, as these questions the most common ones. I can answer them this way. It just really relieves the burden on me. And today's mail. This is Cliff Denchfields. He made a copy of the Cardinal Evolution. Elliot Scott's little uh, spin-off on the Cardinal. Beautiful painter. Nice carbon fiber gear. He's got a Big Jim Super Tiger 46 in here. And a little Brodak finish. Really nice. And we'll pass that on to uh, the Stump News from Cliff Denchfield. This one I fought, and I really did think this was going to be my last coat. What happened, I'm in the middle of spraying what I hope was the last coat. The phone rings, and because I was expecting a call, I'm always expecting a call, I run down to get the phone. I come back up, and of course the paint is still wet, and the wind was blowing leaves. A bunch of leaves blew up right on the, put leaf marks in my mold. So the trick is, and I guess it's a, well, I should have cleared out the garage and just painted in the garage. So we're going to just repeat the same process over and fill in all these little spots. It's almost like I, you feel really smart when these things happen. Where the leaves, they just randomly blew into my, what, what was a reasonably nice finish. But anyway, I'm expecting Rich Jacobone to stop by sometime today anyway with his Stuka cow to, uh, he's getting ready to make a mold, so. And the worst part of all is Chicky was laughing at me. He was, he was absolutely going, yeah, see, you idiot, what are you doing? So he's still molting, getting his feathers, and he's loving the fact that I gotta repair this mold now. But anyway, all part of the game. When you live by the mold, you die by the mold. Or you eat moldy cheese or something. And guess what his words are, his exact words. Ooh, this takes a lot of time. Let's see that Stuka cowling. Now, he's going to take this. This is the plug. It still needs a final finish. Okay, but unfortunately, he's... I'll tell you what. I'll do this plug for you. Go home and buff this wing out, okay? You want to do that? You want to swap me? <laughs> oh, boy, now everything changes. I'm Mike. <laughs> there you go. You got a couple more hours. It's not a big deal at all. This is going to be perfect. And this thing... Believe me, the next plane you make, rattle up the phone. Wendy, there's a hundred dollars going in the mail. Make me a cow. <laughs> That's the point he likes the most. <laughs> this is going to be nice. Okay, but you understand why you need that good finish on there? Otherwise, the part doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't come. It's going to come out not the, the way um, it should. But the finish. You don't have to finish have. in here at all. You don't have to yeah. finish in no. here. You're going to cut that out. The finish that I'm going to have on the outside... It's just like the isn't plane. That, isn't that going to be in the inside of the mold? No, no. It's going to be on the outside of the part when you take it out. Gee, I don't understand that. See, when, when, you, when, you make, when you make this rubber, when you pull this rubber thing out, now what you do is... Explain them. Here's a cowling master. He's used... You pull, the, you pull the rubber off of this now. Okay? Then you turn it over. All right? Now what you have, you have this surface on the inside of the rubber. Right. Oh, okay. Now you take the, the okay. material, the carbon fiber, you line the inside of that, it hardens, then you pull that out. Okay. So that's why this is going to be see, good. if this isn't right, when you take it out, it's going to be... This has to be exactly how you want the plane to look. Right. It'll show every little... Every... If you put a scratch on this, if you take your fingernail, it'll show in there. Now, the other thing I was just... Because I just wrote about this for starters. If you ever crash the plane, the worst scenario, you... They, 
We make another one. How long would it take you to carve this again? About a week, two weeks. <laughs> a week, your ass. It took you a month to make it. it took me about two weeks so oh. far. But but you're done to it now. If you do the same thing with the wheel pants, you never have to make wheel pants again. Every part you like, Midgley made. Midgley did a nice job with the cow mold. Yeah, done. Once it's done, it's done forever. What? All right, you ready to load that lumber? He, he volunteered. Now look, as a it payback. May not, it may not, uh, this plane may not be finished by... Uh, so what? By uh, the So what? My plane isn't even started yet. Who cares? No, that's it. That's Rich, that's like, that's an example. Go look at the cows on a B-25. Oh, no, they're beautiful. They're, they're flawed. There's nothing. If you break one, if you lose one, it doesn't matter. You'll make it on. But you can't make this. You couldn't make two the same if you wanted You see to. the way you have the B-25 cowl in the back? Right. With, with the, the flap. Yeah. The flaps, that's what I want. You could do the this. same thing with this. Sure. You know, by painting the... Yeah, and you could paint them in, or in this case, because this will be... You could cut them in, but then I think when you wipe the plane... No, 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 I don't want to cut them. Just ink it in. Just ink it in. That's all. Paint them in like, uh, like you have. Just ink it in. But now, look, Mike, should we tell him what the payback is? Yep. Tell he him. wants a mold. Now, you got a choice. Here's the choice. <laughs> I'm going to give you the number to call to get the I'm molding afraid. rubber. Here's, I'm afraid, I'm here's afraid the, to ask. Here, you got a choice. If you buy the molding rubber, I make the cow for free. Yeah, if I, I pay for the rubber, I charge you for the cow. How's that? Buy a 55 gallon drum of the. No, no, it's cheap. It's, you, you, you probably got that much money in your pocket right now. You can peel it out right now. Or the third choice is you can carry all this lumber up to the attic so Mike and I can have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> How much lumber do you have? Well, wait, you have 16 footers and they got to go up a ladder three stories. I you want a ladder do? again? Yeah. When that lad is here, nothing good can happen, trust me. <laughs> How did you manage to get this guy? I don't know. He's very hard to come by. His daughter's getting married today. Today's her day. Yeah, yeah. she's getting married today. He's getting married? Yeah. So on his wedding day, he's here. Now, how dedicated is he? On his daughter's wedding day... Congratulations. A blessing on your head. <laughs> mazel tov, mazel tov. No, but you understand now what this has to go... This... Believe me, when you're done with this, this is going to be a beautiful part of the plane. Plus, no matter how thin you make this wood, mine will be lighter. There's no way you can make that thin enough. No, It'll no. be better. You, the first guy picks up the plane, clunk, and it'll be over with. Okay. And then, I'll make you two or three of them. So now you're all set to go. I have to glue this onto this glass. Glue it to the glass. Now, how are you, and paint you're, going to keep, you're going to keep this glued onto the glass? Yes. We don't care about the finish out here. I just want the finish to be a smooth transition. I don't want it to be a notch there. So when you pull apart out, it comes out. But this is good how you have it. That's fine. But the finish on here is just whatever you have on this is going to be how the part looks. Exactly how it looks. It won't be. So it won't be one bit different. I have to shoot this. Yeah, of course. Can't be brushed. You could brush it, but when you go to put the clear on, put the clear on with a spray gun. And just keep putting it on. Put a hundred coats on. It doesn't matter what it weighs. No okay. lines, no bumps. No bumps, no lines. Oh, okay. Because when it's done, you're done forever. It's like you really, ha you got to pay the price now, but when you're done. And if you got lines or bumps on it, and you pours in a hundred dollars worth of rubber, it's your mold. It's your mold, yeah. And it's never going to go away. Every time you pour it. No, it's going to be your mold. <laughs> and when someone, when someone wants a stuke of cow, they're going to have to come to... They're not lining up at the door right now. Well, Look, Matt Newman might be... Matt Newman wouldn't buy something from me if he tried choked to death before he bought it. Matt Newman, if he wants a good... <laughs> All he wants to do is look at no. looking at appearance judging on his knees like he's looking in the girl's shower room. <laughs> Come on, let's go move that wood. Rich has chosen the very popular choice of helping Wendy pull the wood out of the rain. We're on the third floor. The train room is ready. It's pouring rain, and we got to get this wood in. Look, at Mike's out on the ladder already. Hang on, jack of bones in slow motion. Three stories up, Mike's carrying away. Oh, man. Wendy's out on the roof. Oh. Wendy, I think you're and jack of bones on the inside. Why do you get the inside job? You're the dummy. Yeah, but I'm carrying... I'm the homeowner. Why do I get the bed? All the, all the heavy lifting. He wants a raise. Look, what a hell of a time to want a raise. A lot of people that bring lumber in their house, they don't bring it up this way. In the pouring rain. Can you imagine if you fell off of here? <laughs> I was thinking about buying a hang glider too. 
Look get at, at it. Look at them leaves that are not in the pond. Yeah, now there's Mikey's project, the pergola. Every. Do you see how many leaves are in that on that pergola, Rich? That would have all been in my pond. I'd be out there every day scooping them out. So how's that wood look? Out of the way there, Jackaloni. We're ready to build. Why don't you put up a crane? I have friends that come up. Rich, the reason is, he does here. I have friends that come over and work for free like you, so. I know. <laughs> in the port, we let you be inside. What are you crying about? Yeah, well, the room, the room has a two-inch droop in it. We got to account for the two-inch two droop. So all the leaves are going to be three quarters of an inch lower. Well, whatever. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So therefore, you'll have all that for storage. Yep. So everything oh. underneath here, the whole side of the room is going to be storage for my moles and for all this. Okay. If you saw how many things, you saw how many I things I got in here. I saw them. This room used to be empty, but what happens? Because the business is growing and you never stop. Yeah, not only that, but we have all this, everything out of here. We put all this stuff in Before. bins and boxes, kit parts, molds. Before you had most of this stuff. Yeah, there. I remember you had it all stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, when he's done with this train table, it's going to be a work of art. But then everything Mike does is a work of art. <laughs> Even the job I'm going to do in Palisades Park. And from these early days, when I look forward to, uh, I've been watching a lot of train videos lately, trying to come up with some ideas for this layout. Chicky's actually been joining me in this quest. We're trying to think of how we want to sink it and some of the other things we want to do. For anybody that might not know, the modern trains, if you've had Lionel trains and American Flyers, you yes, see Chicky likes them too. Years ago, the new ones with electronic walk-around control, they're just unbelievable, whether they're Mike's train house, K-Line, Lionel, whatever. Just some great stuff out on the market. Now, just exactly the way it is in the world of model planes. It just gets better and better and better and it just gets just gets more fun Mike Kajeski's well what used to be Wendy's 91 Nats motor to live on a cold day how nasty they are <laughs> think that's ready to put right back in a plane. How many years has this been in a plane now? Three years? Three years, yeah. Three years. Look at the quality of this pipe. Three years. I love this. There's nothing. This, this is like a brand. You could sell it to somebody for a brand new pipe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you probably could sell that motor for more than I paid for it. Too. No, no, no. We're just selling nothing. <laughs> I still like it. That was in my 92, 90, uh, no, 89 Cardinal that got second at the 91 Mats. Unbelievable. That motor is still running well 20 years later. Amazing. There's that same motor. <laughs> 1991. Still running 20 years. It's 10 years. Actually, it's 11 years. Anyway, Mike, the reason Mike ran the motor is he had some concern that uh, he's got three full seasons on the motor, and because he had the plane all apart to clean it and winterize it more or less, he wanted to uh, get the motor on a bench and see if if it's needed anything, if it, ne if it needed a bearing, a ring, or anything, we kind of took it all apart. Everything looked exactly the way it should. We put it back, it ran just the way it should. But it's not uncommon for these motors to go very long times, and very long, very, very long times, in fact. So Mike's going to put it back together, and we're, we're ready to go back for as soon as we get some flying days. Boy, is it crappy out there now. This is why I was having my lunch. All right, so you just got to clean it up with the saw. Clean up with the saw and then we'll put it on the belt sander and see what we got. Okay, this is your universal. Guy. I put the new belt on there for you. Oh, wow. I know, boy. Put the new disc on, too? No, I didn't put the disc on. Uh, but the belt, boy, it takes material away now. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm so used to having a dull belt. I, I put the first part there. Ah! <laughs> and if you hit it with your finger, we're going to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> the old one, you hit it. Ah, so what? The old, the old belt used to polish stuff. <laughs> You know, if you want to tell everybody you've been in a bad motorcycle accident, just go rub any part of your body on that sanding belt now. Yeah, that'll do it for you.
Never put a new sanding belt on your machine. Be careful, baby. I'm not kidding you. Well, when you rub your finger in there now, it doesn't hurt. It always has the, the vacuum pulling at the vacuum. Full blow of dust. Look at okay, how quickly it dresses. Oh, yeah. That little bit of epoxy. You want to machine that down, baby. That's the way to do it. Actually, we just did put a new. We took the old belt off. Yeah, yeah. And if you get it like crooked, it'll be really. Then you'll have to send it up the middle or something. It really takes that material right off. Yeah. Okay, the next one of our little tests now that Les is done with his crutch. By the way, how much did that weigh when it's done? 50? Uh. Whatever the scale is set. This, these parts are coming off in between when he's done and the front gets ready. You're actually going to take a lot more material off of there when you're done. So why even worry about it right now? Yeah, that's, that's, and it doesn't, the only thing it'll require is a small, like a 1 16th or 3 30 second right. uh, plate. This will be drilled yeah. and tapped. We, that's right. We still got to see if you can drill and tap that with normal taps. Yeah. Here's the, uh, okay, you're doing a contact supply. Show me all the right. tape that, show me that stuff that you did right now. Okay, well, first of all, what we did was we broke, since we just found out, much to our shock and dismay, that, uh, the Super 77 no longer is uh, uh, compatible with foam because it melts it. I picked up two contact cements. And this is what? This is Elmer's? Okay, this is Elmer's. That's test number, okay. panel number two. And the other's already in there, which is Duro all-purpose spray adhesive. Okay, so this is just another. basically just going to be a test. Okay. Yeah, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Oh, here's the other one up here. I didn't see it. Okay, we're going to find out. Okay, let's do test number one. You mark which is which? Oh, yeah. The panel's marked and the sheeting's marked. Okay. Just keep track of everything and we'll tape everything. Now, so this, the instructions on this say for foam bonding, a light coat to both sides, and then... Uh, Where'd you buy this? In an art supply store? No, this came right out of... Uh, Hardware store? Out of uh, Sears, as a matter of fact. Oh, okay. Midland Park. But uh, the hardware store does carry it. Just do it just like it was a foam wing, that's all. And we'll know right away. The one thing good about doing this, you don't have to wait overnight to see if it's any good or not. Okay. What a smell! Holy mackerel, that smells... You sure, you, sh you sure this isn't some kind of uh, toxic glue? No. Oh! Oh my god, Karen's not home. That's even making me sick. This, is, this thing stinks so bad you can't believe it. Well, phew! Oh my See, God. I don't find that offensive. <laughs> you, you don't find anything offensive. Anything I oh. offensive. When you shower once a month, you don't find that's the problem with our relationship. You don't find anything offensive. I don't find it offensive. All right, let's see what you got going on here. Okay, so this is test number one. Okay, that's the Duro. Duro test one. Yep. Okay. Now, we'll. The yeah, okay, so this is, he's going to let that dry, I guess an hour or so should give it enough time. Did it tell you on the can how long to let it dry? Tell you in a minute. Clean the nozzle. Phew, God, is that, that, that is the worst smelling stuff. What chemicals are in there? Oh! Uh, he coated that stuff, the yep. zero there. Right away, this is, let's, let's get this straight. Duro is, right. there that's you go, a, that's heavy coat. That's a light coat of Duro. It's it looks like you could almost use it. Yeah. It's, it's just barely breaking down the foam. Yeah, but is it, it sticky? How sticky? There's well, no, no stick to it at all. Yeah, but I mean, we'll see how much stick we oh. had on the other one. Now, here we go with the Elmers. By the way, the Elmers contains pretty much the same things. Acetone, dimethyl ether. Oh, great. Isohexane. We're all going to be dead and before this day is over. No, you're not. Goodbye, Chicky. No, you're not. Chicky just fell off the perch. Can I have your engines? <laughs> Let me get the phone. Do the test. So. Here's the test. I puddled it here. All right? Okay. That's dry already. But you see, it yeah. didn't, didn't yeah, attack yeah. the foam at all. Those little finger marks are from That's me. from me. Yeah, right. I stuck my Now, finger. I put a fine coat on. Well, if this doesn't melt, that a fine coat's right. not... The fine coat didn't either. But see, there's nothing in here that's attacking the foam. You see right. what's happening? The foam hey. is the same. Here's the fine coat. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, that's why you got to do the test. And boy, if we if we come up with an answer here. No, here's your fingerprints down here. That's the heavy, right. and here's the fine right there. All right, but let me tell you what we could do as a test right now. Now that you know that that's by the way, this looks like the good one. That's let's go. Percent. Let's go sheet a wing. We got another core. We're ready to sheet it right, right let's, now. Let's run the test. Okay. Well, I, what cares about it? The only part of the test I want to see is if the foam melts. If it doesn't melt in a puddle, it's not going to melt like that. You know what I mean? But see if the bond is good. That's the other thing. By the way, this is why we're doing. This would be thirty-five dollars a shot to throw these cores away if we didn't do this testing. Now I put this on a little heavy here, but that's okay. You see, yeah. this stuff really sprays beautifully, Wendy. That sprays much nicer than you, you know what it is. You got a nicer nozzle. Yep. That that seventy-seven nozzle it puts it on like eighty grit sandpaper. All right, so finish up that part of the test, and uh, if it looks okay an hour from now, we'll sheet the wing. This whole thing is going to be, I know you're getting sick of these tests, but we need to make a decision, because we're going to start building the wings for this plane very soon. So if... Come on, we got to What did you it. decide with these two, by the way? Nothing yet. Nothing, you haven't made it? Well, it's sticking down pretty good. That's Nothing pretty yet. Good. We're going to find out here... How much? This one is sticking down great, number two. What's number two? Numbers. Number two is sticking real good, in fact. Okay, what Les is going to do, he wants to do a repeat of the test for the the black carbon, but this time we're... We're using the heavier black carbon. And epoxy. And epoxy, but we're okay. putting the two ounce cloth on top so as to get them all down, hopefully, with one... Notice that word, hopefully. Okay, we have... And by the way, if you... Karen, you see this can of stuff? Les sprayed this in the house. If you smell anything in the house, it's this stuff right here. It looks like you put all your thing in the bathroom. Yeah. Eat the wrong kind. That's too shiny. It, the exact thing you want to do is do this with the roller. Where's the roller? You want to do this with the... You want to put the roller resin onto the core. How did... What did you decide you wanted to do? No, I want to place this stuff on the core. On roller right there? And wet it from the top. Okay. Okay. See that? It's wetted. Yep. Now, we've already found out that the, the biggest thing where these, where these tests are picking up weight is where in between the foam, the beads, there's globs of cured epoxy or white glue or whatever, but... Hold on to that. Don't let it okay. turn over. Uh, maybe that you're going to get enough through this way that uh, no, I guess we're going to find out. Yeah, but by next week we're going to be making wings, right, baby? By next week we we ought to have wings. And then we invade Poland. No matter what, we're going to invade Poland. No matter. Come on, we got to make wings. One more test day, and that's it, baby. We need test. By the way, Les doesn't like the name I came up with for the new plane. It's Testarossa. He thinks that's not so cool. No, well, it's it's commercial. Oh, well, when you test the R O, it's test the R O S A. At least Oliver will like that. Well, yeah, but he's got to start painting all the heads on the yeah. motors red. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get one anodized red. Jet stuff is all anodized red. The heads, anyway. Figured out the roller is killing us. Uh, what it might down. work? It's a solid roller. Uh, I would trowel. What's wrong with the trowel? Okay. Let me brush you trowel. Well, this let's may be a two put a, put a little spot on here. I'll do this side. This may be a two man. Let's work from the middle out, if nothing That's else. That's what we're doing. We're trying anyway. Well, I've, trowel, I've, baby. I've learned enough. Oh, oh. I've learned enough quicker. In the last week. Yeah, much quicker. quicker. Going through better too. Yep, and you're getting it better. We've learned more about where the weight is in these components than I could have believed. But we certainly know one thing. Now that John Duncan has cored out that original test panel and we're at three ounces, that's a three ounce wing that has even has the finish on that's ready for the silk span. So that's encouraging that we're not totally wasting time here. Well we may not be learning so much. It's, this is where the weight is in this
And the only re reason we're using the carbon fiber is that it added incredible stiffness to that one panel that we uh, when we used the uh, Elmer's uh, yellow glue. Yeah, but it was just just the glue was where the weight was. Right. It, but the, the weight of these things is not in the in the glass or the carbon. It's in the glue. The glue is the killer. take less than that off or you have nothing binding it. Well, let that dry overnight and we'll see. All right, can we work that anymore or not? Yeah, here, give it a, just get a feel for how that's working. I wouldn't want to put any more heat on that. But see if you can squeeze you up a little bit more. Let me get the phone. Now you're going to try the little test with white glue, right? Right. Okay, so we have them side by side. Oops. And this is only a test of adhesion. Okay. Nothing more. All right. Now I had one of those little mixing cups. First we're going to use type one. The real test here is how much coffee did he drink today? Holy mackerel. He's on his 12th cup. No. <laughs> no, I had, I had 18. He was ready to put the glue in the coffee. I had 18 before <laughs> I got here. Oh, man. Uh, let me All see. Right. What is going to be straight glue or fifty fifty? No, 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 no. We the last time we used two parts glue to one part water. Our first test is and we at the mad scientist lab grams. here to create a Frankenstein. We glue create something. I don't know. Oh man. Okay. Well, anyway, we've already done this white glue test, but that's that's going to be that. And tomorrow when we come back to this, we'll at least learn one more little piece. But we got to get started making wings pretty soon. Rings and fuselages. Test the rosa. This morning we got <coughs> open up the mail here, and the first thing I see is we got a. It looks like a CD from Fred Cronenwet. I'll see if I can play this on my computer. You never can tell, but I'm going to try to figure out if there's a way I can play this. Well, I'll wait till Karen gets back. She's usually the master of figuring this out. But anyway, I had spoken to Fred on email about getting all his pictures. Well, I guess he's already done it. So he beats me to the punch. But anyway, to, to be fair about this, Fred is com Fred and, and Bill Young have contributed a lot to our program over the years. Always, always the latest and greatest in photos and documentation. Of course, there's and video. Of course, there's scale flyers. This is one of the things that one of the other people in our group is busy trying to figure out what kind of a paint job he wants to have on this. And so Fred is forwarding a copy of this to me also. And obviously I'll look this over. It's the restoration of a, looks like a P, is it a 63 or a 39? It's be a 63. Anyway, we're going to read it. And as always, every anytime I've ever asked Fred for some documentation or some something, he, oh look at this motor, wow. Oh, that's cool. Individual exhaust stacks, unlike on the Spitfires where they put the two exhausts into one. Anyway, this will be interesting reading today. We have to wait for, uh, for less. We've got a couple more days of testing we want to do before we actually start making wing panels. In fact, today we may start making wing panels. We wanted to try all these little ideas that we had in the back of our mind. Ooh, look at this. Ooh, this is nice. Clipped wing, it looks like. I would say that's a clipped wing. Anyway, for somebody looking for a semi-scale stunch, geez, you better build it real light if you clip that much of the wing away. Always some good ideas. And what's really neat is when the scale guys and the stunt guys can kind of share their documentation technology. We all like the Reno Air Races. There's, look at there's an A26 here. Check this out. Fred didn't even know we're working on an A26. This is 1946, 
Anyway, Mike Mike Estella has emailed me and told me he's got a whole bunch more A26 stuff. And Sunday we're getting our A26 wing cores, so we're going to sheet those up right away, of course. Johnny Duncan's almost been on uh, overtime working on stuff for us. We've got about nine wings from the one of the ones begin. Anyway, from Fred. Oh, that's a nice one. I will check this all out, needless to say. Now, I always liked this. One of the things I always thought was cool about this 39s and the 63s was the little scoop. If you notice, I use this to my advantage many times. I always thought that was a cool idea to have the intake right behind the cockpit. As you can see where I got that idea from. I guess everything we do in modeling is something you always get the idea or very few of these things just come out of the sky. You usually get them from some kind of a picture or some kind of a, uh, well, some idea. And I'm, I'm really thanking Fred for sharing that with us. We certainly put that in our archives. Look at this on the, the other sweeper, the one that was on a cover of Flying Models. But anyway, you get these ideas and that's... <laughs> Letting the cat, that's where I got that idea years ago. Anyway, thanks a lot to Fred. On today's mail, I got some ultralight parts here for the front of the B-25. As we head, we're under 83 ounces now. We started at 86, we're down to, I'm guessing, by the time I get done putting all these little lightweight parts on, we're going to be sneaking up on having what we really ultimately want here is to be at 80 ounces did is he made some special washers out of some lightweight aluminum and various these are, these are supposed to be Hamilton standards of course various lengths of them so I can vary that last little bit of weight also took the, the stock and this is just one way of doing it and got some of the material out of the back of the thrust cones but anyway even just this little bit it's probably another couple of grams here a couple of grams what happens is it all adds up has made up these nuts of course and these are a lot lighter we've got just under a half ounce lighter hardware on here now but I wanted to polish them up because on the stock plane you can usually either paint it or polish and in our case you want it I just think it'll look nicer if it's polished the point is you can do this with anything with a spinner or whatever just have a little grindstone Another little tip that may be worth working on, or worth thinking about, if you're going to polish, the black aluminum almost never comes out from under your fingernails. If you just wear rubber gloves, that takes care of that in one stroke of the Also, you can see the difference between one that's, one that's polished and one that's not polished. I kind of like the polish look a little better myself. And it's all these little details that seem to make the, uh, well, the project of the B-25 just a little more exciting for me anyway. Do it. Do you We're here. We're here in A-26 bomber land, and Mike can't decide since the span of a real plane is 70 feet, and we want to make a 70-inch model. What's the ratio? Let's see, does Demick know? <laughs> only because somebody else fixed it. <laughs> Look at all the silence in this room. The minute you have an educator, <laughs> none of us can go one to twelve. We're artists, not oh. mathematicians. You know? What I'm saying is, if you get that, just make the span 70 and you're in. If you give that to Mike Cooper. Cooper can do that. Let him scan it, he'll trace it, and then he can print that it. That would be the way to do it. You want. In other words, Mike, what we want to do is have this wing, but in A26 format. You know that wing is going to carry 80 ounces. You know it'll carry two motors. And you want to have it roughly 70 inches. If you steal an inch or add an inch, I don't think it'll matter. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to make it 80. You know what I'm saying? No, I wouldn't. Be, I wouldn't. be within, and of course, look at all the planes. Well, this hey, little guy is cute. but <laughs> This is pretty elementary stuff. Johnny cut the cores already. <laughs> We're, we're, we're oh, no, no, no. Johnny can cut more cores. No, no. We paid for the cores. <laughs> oh, no. You paid for the cores. <laughs> you may have two of these. No. Well, you're paying for the next <laughs> set. 
I'll make the tails. <laughs> no, we want to get this blown up so this is 70 inches. Then we got a starting point. And I think you're going to have to add flaps. Well, fudge this forward an this inch. This is what we do. We just fudge this part of the airplane and shrink. Now, if you've, ever, if you've never lived in a part of the country where the leaves are from, look at these leaves. Look at these piles of leaves. But anyway, it looks like we have a flyable day, and Rich wanted to go out for a little while, so thought we'd take the B-25 out for a couple little, hopefully get some decent flights or get some motor testing done. up here from Florida and what we're going to try to do we have Scott Dinger's exhaust on here we're going to resync the engines of course we don't have any pressure taps on these for muffler pressure so the first couple of flights we're going to try running it without muffler pressure and start the test at that way but that uh, is the first piece of data we need today Watch, give me the total time too from after oh, yeah. it takes off just for see. It had plenty of time. I don't think it's gonna be short. Yeah, I don't know why. But if it is, I'll put the gaskets in anyway.
Okay, this is the uh, first flight with the extra head gaskets in. On uh, Wednesday, November 20th. Uh, we put two extra head gaskets in each engine. This is funny, but Dennis, you can see it's dark already, the sun is gone. Dennis launched the B-25 the whole afternoon after Rich left, and what he got is a free shoe shine <laughs> with oil. Actually, we learned a couple of things. We put some head gaskets in there. The Scott Dinger headers seem to let the motors run, motor run freer, a little more powerful. A couple of Fox head gaskets took care of that. And we were able to, with, with the Dinger uh, exhaust, because they're less restricted, we were able to go right to a full 11. We got them deep pitched. They start as 11 sixes, but they'd be pitched a full 11 inch prop. So from this point on, we're going to start working with the 11 inch props a little bit. And we got the tens back in the paper towels where they belong. It didn't seem unhappy at all with that, did it, Dennis? No, no, it seemed very, very happy. And Dennis is a prop manufacturer. Why are you a prop man? <laughs> well, after today, we ought to call you the shoe shine. I'm a shoe shine guy. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Anyway. Another really fun day with the B-25. Thanks, Dan, for shooting the footage. The overall feeling is that the, the little headers are fine. I'm going to have to make up some different aluminum washers for this. We had to space it out. The props didn't fit right on the shaft the way they should. Because we've never had those on the plane. But that was certainly an interesting day. And we're running no muffler pressure now, just wide open headers. Okay, this is, let's see, you got, it's glassed? No, 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 it's glassed, yes, okay. but what I did not do is spray it. Okay. Okay, this is all brushed on. Okay, that's okay. 
And what I want to do now... See, down here it's a problem. You're going to see that in a mold. You want to get a little... Sand that smooth. See how it's rough in this corner here? Well, now are we going to cut this here? You could, yeah, if you're going to cut this all out. But it's if you really want to, I would leave a little rip in there. Oh, really? Okay, then I'll sand that. So, otherwise, the final part's going to have that. And you send it yeah. to Matt Newman, he's going to want his money back. <laughs> that looks good. Let me see from the other side. And Brian's plexiglass worked perfectly. Oh, yeah, this is, this is good. Okay. So it's the next brushed. mold to walk for... Uh, it's all brushed on, Wendy. You know, it's not... It's that, not it doesn't matter. you got to buff it out now. Well, no. What I want to do is I want to put some color on it, as you oh, suggested. Just use up any paint yeah. you have. And then and I'll, I'll buff put it clear, out. And I'll put clear on it. Right. And buff it and, you know... And then we'll wax it and we'll get, we'll make the box and I'll pour... I'll, I already got the rubber to make it, so... Good. They charged me $87. And so what we learned in that session, even though we edited out about 10... 10 or 15 of the flights, it was getting dark at the end and everything. From this point in the test on, we have some extra head, head gaskets in the engines, and we also have full 11 inch stalker props. We were not able to turn those without, uh, again, without the Scott Dinger exhaust. They are, they are really like funny car parts, they're totally unrestrictive. And a, as a bonus, a free bonus, the sound. And that's one of the biggest things I get off the videos when I come over. I can listen to that 2-4 run. I can hear those motors turning on and shutting off. You can turn your sound up on a TV. I think even, you know, you can do that from any angle. Anyway, that was really, a, really a good day. So after reviewing <coughs> the video that we took the last couple of days, I wanted to make two modifications today. What I wanted to do, I want to take some pitch out of the prop, very little, maybe the thickness of a piece of paper, because we're using a full 11 inch props now. These headers, again, to, to show the logic here, the headers allow the motors to run at a more powerful setting. We've added head gaskets. Richard Oliver is hopefully going to be able to get us some heads with a little bit lower compression, just so we have both in inventory. And what I want to do is set up some these headers don't have a pressure tap, so I have the choice of running muffler pressure, no muffler pressure. And that was one of the things I wanted to try, along with the lower pitch props. Now, if we go too far on the next test day, I'll just test with the 10-inch props. I'll always have the 10-inch props set as my square one. One thing I really believe strongly, and you can see what I have, I have a box with all my balancers and jigs and gizmos and things that I use to reference my square one. But what I'm a big believer in, and I've gone through this many times, but, but just to, to show where this is going with the twin engine plane, I have a gauge. This is my angle of pitch. If you look down the gauge, you can see the angle of pitch. I need a little washer to space the 11 inch props up. But what I did off camera is I took and we're boiling water, and we've done that a million times, and repitched them. So you can just, let's see if we can see this up on tape. See how much the trailing edge is up now? Maybe the thickness of a piece of paper. And of course I want to make all the blades symmetrical. And what really happens now, because we use that pitch, the, the all, this is the part that really matters. If you had a lot of things that all matter, this is the one that matters. It's an inch from the tip. All this in here, yeah, it's nice. You, you can pitch these stations until you're blue in the face, but this is the one that matters. And what I do is this is the pitch that I've arrived at for running engines in the 10,000 to 10,500 range. Well, you can pretty much see I've drilled one for each setting. I want to be roughly an inch from the end, and I usually sight it this way. But now with the, with the props pitched in a lower mode, one of the things that's going to happen is the engine is going to unload more. So when it unloads more, in essence, it's going to, it's going to run in a higher RPM range. Anytime you depitch the prop, you up the RPM range. What's going to happen, I want to have the option of putting on the muffler pressure to soften out the motor run. The muffler pressure always softens out the brake. Taking it off makes the brake more pronounced. I'm putting so much time into this at the very end of this, rather than starting the Testarossa or the new 40 plane, which we're, we're obviously doing development, we're going to be starting that very soon. But any day that's a flyable day, I'm trying to get as much of the tuning done on this 
so that over the winter I can just put this aside and in the spring we'll be ready to fly it. I won't be under a lot of pressure then to finish up the other plane. Now, I originally had the, the original set of headers set that I could take and use uh, muffler pressure. These I'm going to have to pull the whole thing apart, pull the headers off. And I didn't want to do that because I wasn't sure in the very beginning if the headers were going to be appropriate, if they're going to be too restrictive, not restrictive enough. I also have to see where I can get... See, there's a lot of things going on. Oh, let me show this. There's a lot of things going on in there. And you can see the linkage. You can see where that passes through. It's a very complicated place, so I have to mark exactly where I want to have that pressure fitting, number one. I've also learned another thing using OS Max carburetors, which I assume all carburetors are the same. This little rubber piece of fuel tubing is extremely critical. What happened one time when I put it together, this tubing wasn't sealing up the way it should, and I couldn't get the needle to set right at all. So having that little piece in there was just a real critical thing. These are the little things you'll learn one step at a time. We're ready. You have pressure taps right on the head. I don't know if you can see it in here. So now we do have the option, the next flying session, of using the muffler pressure having the lower pitch props and that's some of the things I can pick up off the video that are that are helpful in well, just improving the model on a day-by-day uh, -day basis. Some people think, and you know, maybe that's the way they, they operate, that once a model's done, you're done and you fly it, trim it, and you're done with it. Well, in my case, and I think in a lot of people's cases, it never ends. It ends the day the plane goes up into the Spitfire bedroom or up into our soon-to-be train room, Spitfire room, but we basically are going to try to fine-tune this every step of the way because there's so much to learn, and anything we learn from this, we can immediately apply to our A26. From the drawing board, and basically what it is is the top view of the fuselage crutch here is what it'll look blended into the look like blended into the spinner and this is the outer wall the carbon fiber spinner uh, either one okay All they're right. pretty close now yeah. this line over here represents this line but in an eighth of an inch okay so that's for figuring out your formers yeah this not only for figuring out the formers what I'm going to do is out of two pound foam cut the top of the fuselage and then when we laminate the doublers hmm. and the fuselage sides and things, we can do it right on the mold and we'll get the, we won't have to be bending it. Not only that, this will become the silhouette for the, for the crutch. Okay, and so what this will have is you can, you can take the crutch silhouette exact, deduct the right. thickness of the body and the doublers. Right. You'll, you'll see further along. There's a whole system that goes with it. What you do every time you build the airplane is you take a piece of 332nd or 8th, you put this thing down, you cut along the edge, flip it over, cut along the edge. You've got a perfect, perfect uh, former for the top of the crutch. Okay, beautiful. And it adds stiffness. And so now what are you going to do? You're going to cut this out next? The next yeah, step is you're going to cut this out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this side whole. I'll come in here and then cut this line here because this is the one we want to cut in foam. Okay. All right? And I'm going to make two. One for the top, one for right, the bottom. Right, right. Hot wire it. Okay. And that'll be it. That'll work. Yep. So coffee and a bagel never <laughs> tasted so yeah. good as what Clyde would do. Well, Les is bringing over lunch. Now, so look at this. It's in his coffee. The coffee cup has dust. He can write his name on it, dust. <laughs> what kind of bagel is this? Dust and onion or what? You got it. Anyway, you're still working on that curve, huh? Okay. Well, no, what I'm doing now... The Let me see is, what you're doing here, Poncho. The curve is there, but what I want to do is make these perfectly smooth so that when I go to hotwire the... So what I'm hoping is that by the things that you see that we're trying to work on on the video, that this will also... You'll come up with some ideas that will probably even be better or at least just as good, and by sharing them, we'll probably, uh, we'll probably be able to really come up with something good on this fuselage, no one less. See, the people that don't know how good you are, he's the Pavarotti. You're going to be sure how good I'm not when this video is over. The two things about Les, he is very good and he is 
not not the fastest worker in the farm. That's a point. He's I not think. Mike Kajeski or Wendy. Where do I take some? But it's okay. We got time. That. God, look! You can, yep, the TV screen is even. You can write your name on a TV. Look at this. Well, that's Holy because there's an electrical charge there that takes. Oh man, that's better than uh, you know using a vacuum. Okay, so you're almost done with this. Yeah. All right. Then I'll break these apart. Uh, yeah, yesterday Wes finished that spine. Still needs some work, so we're not going to bother even putting that on video yet. Anyway, these are some pictures, and I set from uh, Ian Nealens. He's in California, and he's got some really nice, unusual, I would say. It's a modified, and I'm only reading his copy, it's a modified Dick Sarpolis design. Span was increased to 60 inches. And you can see in this picture some of the take apart. I guess this is the take apart features here. And there's only one caption for the whole set of pictures. So what I'll do is go through the through the set of pictures. Very unusual looking design, anyway. And we're always looking for unusual stuff here. And like, I'm, I'm looking as if this is probably a camouflage job for leaves. <laughs> Not sure. Anyway, got two planes here. An unusual paint scheme, to say the least. I think Jose Modesto would be jealous. Anyway, and this is the part we wanted to say for, for the, the second part. This is a twin engine plane. Take a real close look at that. Don't just don't just blow it off. It looks pretty cool. It's a pro, it looks like a profile design. I would I would venture to say it's the wildest paint job on the planet. Now I wish I had more. It's a two Fox 25s. That, that certainly has the look of a wild paint job. And if you look at this real close, it's look at the dragon or whatever that is. That it really does look pretty cool. Anyway, when I pass these on to Stunt News, I wish I had more of a caption, but I'll send in the original letter, I think. Tom can figure out what the appropriate caption for that is. From Ian Nealens. This is from our friend Kevin King in Canada. And I thought he had told me about this on the uh, on the phone the other day. And I thought, holy crap, i got to try this. Well, what it is is after you sand silver or filler or whatever, he uses these and let's see. They're an electrostatic cloth with no chemicals or waxes to wipe it down. So the first time I used it, I could, the first time I used it to wipe off my plane, I stood there for 10 minutes looking at my plane in amazement. Well, there wasn't a speck of dust on anywhere. Uh, you can buy at Safeway or Walmart about 20 for five, so that makes them reasonable in price. Anyway, we're going to try this. We're going to be doing some painting pretty soon. Maybe sooner than we think. And I'll pass this little tip on to Stunt News. In fact, anytime I have something I'm going to include in Stunt News, this kind of a tip is the perfect thing. And I encourage everybody to send in their ideas. The more ideas we have, the more fun we'll have building these models. So over the weekend, went down to our, our friends, the Raritan Valley Train Club. Got to see their, uh, their new layout, new and improved layout. Shot some video. I'm not going to include any of it on here, but it's it's good stuff because I'm trying to gather data and information and things to build my own old gauge railroad soon. And it's coming up on a time when we, by the end of this week, we're going to have our Christmas tree up. Always a lot of fun having the trains up by Christmas time. His mail came. One of the things I've been looking forward to to working with. This is for Jack Comer, one of our friends who's going to be working on a cardinal kit and what he's going to have me do is break in his side exhaust 61 this is one of the motors we've spent some time with in Strega 
really were high, were very high on this motor. I flew it in the last contest of the year. Really liked the way it ran. And I wanted to show the muffler. This is the muffler that comes with the engine. But I think it's an extra cost option, I'm not sure. But anyway, we're gonna we're gonna try to in the next day or so because we're expecting a big snowstorm. Now look, when when Richard sends out these motors, and this is really nice that he does this, he's got all the information here. All the little tips and tricks. It's a great little write-up. All the things are appropriate for breaking in the motor, but what we're gonna do is basically break in the motor. The shims, gaskets, and of course the mandatory jet towel, the crying towel. But anyway, if you've never seen one of the side exhausts, we've had two of these in the shop for a while. This is a, a bar stock. Now this is not a cast case. Bar stock. Just look at some of the workmanship on this. But if you like high quality stuff. Anyway, if we get to, before the snow comes, we're gonna hopefully get uh, get this broken in. We'll get this all put together off camera. But I don't know what Les had in mind today, but we are racing against this the snowstorm that's headed our way, so we're gonna try to get this broken in in the course of the day. things I do. I bend the needle valve. Of course you can bend this if your fuselage sides end here and you want to bend this a little further out. It's made out of a soft material so you can bend it in and out. Not a problem at all to, to change the bend to suit the, the need of the plane. Well, well that's probably just about right. The motors don't come with a glow plug. I suggest the plug that I like is a Thunderbolt volt and a half long. I don't know which one Richard's been using, but we've had real good luck with our volt and a half longs. And we'll try one of those in here. But we usually just use a spare plug just to break the engine and not a real good plug. I love the look of these. Boy, these are nice. It's a good idea, too, to not get these wet. All of these things are written up in the instructions, but when you start dealing with something this nice, it's like just when you go buy, go down to the store and buy a new Ducati or a Ferrari, you know, you tend to keep it in the garage. This is really a piece of work, really nicely made. And we hope this is going to serve Jack really well over the years. I like how that seals right up with a gasket. And we're just going to wait and see if Les is going to get here or... If we're going to work in the shop today or if we're going to break in engines, you never know. Every day here is an adventure. But boy, I'll tell you, I like having these in the shop. They're like jewelry. They're like, they're like <laughs> the things you can just hang around, put around the shop. Anyway, we'll see if... what What's in store? Another great day at Wendy's. I'm glad we broke Jack Comer's engine in because today we're going to be <laughs> waiting for the second half of the snowstorm coming. I don't know if Les is going to make it today. But we got our foam wings in. Luckily we got them just before the snow came and didn't hold up production. We got our foam wings back from John Duncan. Now I was out yesterday shooting some train video and Les wound up picking these up. I see he left a note on them. But we're going to be ready. It's almost time to really start building. We got a couple little details left to figure out on what we're going to do with these wings. As soon as Les gets here, we're going to make a decision and move forward, I hope.
this is where I was yesterday with Rich Day. You see Rich Jackabone in the day. I'm, I'm editing down the tape now. Look in the background. This guy has a giant old gauge train layout. But he, what he had is a collection of these operating things, cars. Just um, look at it. Look at a village. He's got a village, a circus where everything moves. And we're going to be visiting with him uh, in the near future. But in the meantime, we got to see his his uh, this tremendous, tremendous train layout. He has 450 square feet. Takes up his whole basement. And it turns out, Rich Jacobone and Arnie is his name, Arnie Haber, that what they did is they went to, to high school together and they went uh, actually to high school with the same school that Whitey Ford went to, so had a lot of fun over there yesterday, but we got to get back to model aviation here. If, I, if I've learned one thing over the years is that it's a small world and for Rich to have met one of his people that went to the same aviation school. Rich went to an aviation school. We had a great day over there with Rich, with Arnie, and seeing his train layout. And Arnie had a bunch of, I, I wish I would have videotaped him, a bunch of, he was building scale you control models way back in the, in the 60s. So just one more, it's a small world. And it seems like the older we get, the smaller it gets. I gotta go put some coffee on. Even I'm tired this morning. I'm waiting for Les to get here. I wanted to take the mold that's going to be our cardinal, cardinal kit wing. You can see I've got it pretty well polished and waxed. Put a tape band around the edge just so I can get a nice line to cut the two halves apart. And what I'm going to do now is build a box around. I'll do it off camera. Just build a box around it. Because within the next couple of days, we're going to set up a dedicated day that Les and I are going to make the mold. And that'll be pretty labor intensive. But I can get the box made today and get it all prepped. And I'm going to have to get four coats of wax on this, two hours apart, and then two or three coats of PVA on it but to get it prepped for the day that we're actually going to do the mold. But this will be a good thing to take care of today with a little snow out there and building snowmen and everything. Huh. We expected to have a lot more snow, so we actually lucked out on this. So the last project I worked on here got the whole box made. We have all the material in-house from George Sport to make the layup for this. But we, like again, the next thing I have to do is set aside a dedicated day that I can have less here, but that we can work together on it. So it's a lot easier if it's a two-man job. This mold polished up beautifully, and we're going to be ready to cast it up, I hope, within the next week. First thing we're working on today is a little project for Karen, making a tile frame for our medicine cabinet. We bought some glass tiles. Les is making up a uh, an eighth inch plywood backer for it. We're gonna tile it. It's Karen's little surprise. We got to do this before she gets home. Nice, nice. Are you impressed? Uh -huh. Ah! I see, the whole trick is extra coffee for less, and everything fits like a glove. Get this huh? kid wired. Oh, get them wired up, baby. Now. This is our original test panel that we've cored out to, what, an eighth of a, not even an eighth of an inch. Probably closer to 330 seconds. And this was really a test panel. But it's really nice and light. This is three ounces now. This panel glass is three ounces, so that's kind of encouraging. But the one place that we needed to maybe leave a little more material is here at the trailing edge. And the reason is... This has a curve in it, so it's relatively stiff. This is real, it's got a curve, but back here it's flat. It's almost flat, and this part just tends to be a little flimsier than we'd like. So Les had a great idea in between working on Karen's, uh, what are we gonna call it? The tile from hell. The barn door. The barn door. Is to just, now we can make new templates without making new, the cuffs don't have to change. We can just put these radiuses in. And that will, when we make our second test panel, which we're going to make up next here. Now, you've not increased oh, yeah, yeah. that much fun. Nothing, nothing. It's just put bigger radiuses in there. Yep, yep. And I think that'll work. Anyway, this looks encouraging. I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to throw this panel away, boy. This is this this might be the world's lightest foam wing right now. I don't know. 
And John, you can see the kind of quality John Duncan did. This is really nice. And I'm not so sure we're not going to even be able to use this, but what we'll do is we'll change the templates, make another panel, and then make a decision if we want to join them or make the third panel and keep this. The other choice we, we didn't know is if we were going to just add another layer of fiberglass to the, another layer of eight, eight, uh, yeah, 0.5 cloth, or when we originally did it, to use three-quarter ounce cloth. Both of those choices are possible. Another thing, too, we could take this spar, whatever piece goes in the back here. We have this piece. Mm -hmm. Carefully cut a piece right out of the middle, and just pack it in there and put a couple of drops of... Uh, just to see how much that extra foam would add, you know what I mean? I mean, we could feel it. This way we have it, we can test it out. Coring it this thin, what I did was I extrapolated the bare weight of this blank prior to coring, and the one from Elliot. Right, right. Which is cored John's way, you know, thick wall. Right. The thin wall coring saves just a, a little over an ounce. But don't forget, the other thing, this, not an ounce, this already has a finisher on it. Mm. That's not raw wood. Yeah, but I, what, basically what I'm saying is, if you take the finish that you put on this, right. just compare raw foam to raw foam, cord this way, you're saving 1.05 ounces per okay. wing. And so that's two ounces over the whole wing. Per wing. It's a half ounce a panel? Half ounce a panel. Five okay, so it's an, an ounce a wing. And it's free because it takes just as much time to do this as do it the other way. Mm -hmm. It's made a little piece from the scrap here. From the cutter. How big? Had to recontour it. Had to recontour it at the back because the wire made it a perfect shape. Oh, okay. So I had yeah. to sand it. I cut it with a knife. Put a little white glue on it. You just happen to have this nice carbon rod hanging around. We'll just let the weight of it. Yeah, just hang it up. Put that in a vise or something. Well, we'll put it between. We can hang it up, uh, you know, between two things here. <laughs> two things of equal, equal, equal height. The only way to show you how cool this was, I didn't have any tile glue, so of course we use fiberglass. So this way I'd be able to make this up for cat. Oh, she's gonna, she's gonna love me. Anyway, look like we learned something from this. Can't figure out what to do with it now. He's going to say, put it in Chicky's cage. Let him make a perch out of it. I can always hang it uh, a whole, you know, just just walk around for three days. Why we pay less the big money. He's got this all engineered up. Took out his MIT degree today to show me that he's a real engineer. Look at this. You think Boeing would hire us? I don't think so. Anyway, he's going to add radius. what not to do. <laughs> Empty the garbage. Anyway, he's got the... Uh, Bigger radiuses. We're going to modify the templates. That's what we can do that today, huh? There's no big deal. You're just going to make a new end plate. Is that what you're planning on doing? Just make I, a new end plate? I, I, I would guess, but I got to tell you something. I think there's enough left in these radiuses. He could pin them. Hmm. One, two, three, four. Five. You could do just what we did with the other piece. Well, not really. Just for this, we're doing a test piece anyway, so. But anyway, we want to try to settle this up so we can really get, uh, well, get to the next, the next emotional level of this project. Now, Ellis, all you got to do is just make new port this, and put them right on top of these. It doesn't matter how far out they are. That's true. I mean, it, you could just put. We got plenty of light fly too, and you could do all like grinding with those those tools that you have, right. that'll be pretty pro. All right, so wait a minute, that's three quarters, that's uh, nine sixteenths radius. Uh, if you ever wanted to see something uh, that I thought was pretty cool, Mike Costello and I, in, in building the A26s, of course, we're trying to use as much of the B25 technology as possible, and you can see how close this is going to be when it's done. I think it's going to be pretty... Uh, Pretty exciting, at, and Mike wants to make his more scale. He's already got a Z-Tron, already got motors for it, but I'm not sure which, because he's going to fly it in scale anyway. He wants to have different features than I have. But I remember how far, how far it was not long ago that we just had foam cores, and the B25 was kind of a dream, kind of like what the thing less is working on now. That's a dream, and 
maybe a year from now that'll be a reality that everybody can share. The project I'm working on, as if we didn't have enough, of course, we got the tile part. These are, these are tunnel portals, and this is just one way. I made a little box. I'm, I'm using up my Mold Max 30 molding rubber here. I'm going to make a mold so I can make my own out of either urethane or fiberglass, make my own tunnel portals, because on this layout that I'm going to be building, I'll need several of them. And these, believe it or not, are very expensive in, in terms of this was $54 to buy all these parts, but once I make the mold, I can probably make thousands of dollars worth of parts out of the one mold before it goes bad. And because it's got a rough surface, it picks up a lot of the molding rubber. I've been pouring it on one cup at a time in very thin layers, trying to get all the air bubbles out. But we'll see what this looks like in a couple of days when it cures out. This is the last of the, uh, the pours. That's going to have to sit overnight with the heat. Got the heat on in the house, the heating vent open. It'll allow that to self-level overnight. And we'll see in the morning if we have a, uh, well, we don't know if we're going to have a usable part. Just, just one other little modeling technique we can use. See, that's what's nice about a lot of this stuff. A lot of the things you do in, well, in other events like model railroading, for instance, or in radio control or pylon racing or something, you find out you can use that same technology in other things. And in this case, a little foam wing, the templates Les is working on. He took them back. He's going to finish them today. That looked like it's going to be a real usable thing. He's got to update the templates. And the last thing we have over here, we have our... We're ready to actually make the molds very soon. So I guess it wasn't the worst day in the world. Even though we had to deal with some crappy weather, we got about seven, eight little things in. And we're clearing the deck because we're going to start building these, these fruity ships. What I'll call, for lack of a better word, the Testarossa. Wes likes to call his the Paladin, but they're basically going to be the same plane. And there's just no end to the stuff that's coming out. I think we're working in the shop about 16 hours a day now. We have some little carburetors coming, but with the snow on the ground now, I doubt we're going to be doing much flying in the very near future. So. Hope to see you on the next tape. Hope you picked up some good ideas from this tape and enjoy every part of the world of model aviation. Again, please share the video. Please uh, pass around the tapes. See if you can pick up some new ideas from other people. And when you do, pick them up. Write them up for stunt news. Let's get them on the videos. And that way I think we all have the most amount of fun possible. And hey, we look forward to a great building season starting very soon. We are really going to dig in in the next week or two.